All right, well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Ask Us Anything. I'm Mark Graben, Senior Advisor with Kinexus. We are joined by... Greg Jacobson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kinexus. And this is actually, I don't know if you realize this, Greg, this is number 30. This is the 30th, 30th Ask Us Anything that we've done going back, maybe what, I'd have to look, six, seven years? I think so. I would have only known it was a 30th because the invite said you know, <laughs> AUA number 30, the big three O. So we're happy to do this. We're glad that the questions are, uh, still flow in. And, you know, we're, we're going to, I think we may go up to an hour here and we appreciate everybody coming in. We appreciate people submitting questions. This is pretty loose compared to our presentation webinars where we're, we're going to have, you know, some good questions and we're going to banter back and forth. And then um, we're going to look ahead. Those of you who attend our presentation webinars, the next one is going to be November 1st. It's going to be presented by Dave Kippen, who I met up in Michigan at the Michigan Lean Consortium event where we had some Kinexus people um, at in August. He's going to be giving a presentation, I think a really interesting topic, lean and mindfulness. Hmm. And the registration for that will open real soon. I apologize for not having it open now. Um, but you can go to kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, Greg, you, uh, let, let me ask you just as a first question here. Like you, you kind of reacted to that. So yeah. quick, I, our audio check sounds great, but we got feedback that they can't chat in the webinar. So I don't know if there's anything we need to do. If someone could chat just to make I sure. I can here. try to adjust some settings. So speaking of checklists, that's uh, something we may need to add to the checklist. I will do what we call a short-term countermeasure. I will try to contain the problem by adjusting the settings. But Greg, maybe you, you reacted, I think, to the word mindfulness. Um, riff, 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 riff on that for a minute. And I think I've got chat turned on here. Like, is that what you were reacting to or the oops chat? I just thought it was super interesting that, that I hadn't heard lean in mindfulness. And I feel, I feel that... Probably my first association with mindfulness in my life was I learned to do transcendental meditation back in college, and it was a uh, it was a habit that didn't stick. But uh, we can talk about habits later. But uh, I, I do feel as though I, I'm trying to be more self aware about how my emotions and my reactions are affecting other people. Um, as we are further into this journey, I. I'm constantly reminded that whether or not I think of myself as the CEO, um, I just think of myself as another person working at Pinexus, but um, but I am. And so I just need to be cognizant of that, whether I feel I have that um, kind of title or not. So that that, that was my reaction. Then. I was like, yeah. I don't think I'm going to talk about this. Well, so uh, yeah, is transcendental meditation, is that something that, that you learn or you, I guess you learn and then practice? Hey, it was, it's a very kind of simple form of meditation that I, I think, I think all meditations with my cursory knowledge bring about some amount of mindfulness and self-awareness. And um, so it, it was just the name of it. I, I think it was um, a, a fatty type of meditation, but I think if you probably look at what it is, there's common threads in many different kinds of meditation. So yeah. it was a mantra based meditation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've, I've tried that. I like, you know, a lot of people during pandemic times, like you get an offer, like, Hey, here's a free meditation app. And I, and I, and I tried it and I, I really have trouble quieting my mind, which I, I know is what you're supposed to be working at. And you're not supposed to get frustrated. Right. If that's difficult, like that's part of what that journey is, but you know, that that's not something that I've tried harder to pursue. Now I do try to be more aware. Like I think a related thing is being more self-aware. Yeah. How am I behaving? How am I coming across? Is my perception of that calibrated with how others are reacting? That's or how they're perceiving it. That's mm -hmm. that's probably something for a, a leader. And, and back to your point, I mean, Greg, this is a, a a common situation of like the positional authority versus the personality of the person. And I've seen this a lot in healthcare where people like. I'm 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 just a person. Like I, I I'm approachable, and like as a person you are. But like you said, it is a fact that you are the CEO. Like it or not, there's positional authority, and people might be bringing that with them from another job. 
right, of how they've been taught to defer to a CEO or how, how to interact with a CEO. And, you know, that, 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 that's different than how you are as a CEO. But I think it's good to be aware of like, are people reacting to me, the person, or are they reacting to me in this position? Right. And I think what's interesting about it is I, I feel as if it kind of adds an extra level of stress to what I'm trying to do because I feel <clears throat> feel that I need to be kind of on my game. Um, mm -hmm. if I'm kind of having, you know, a low energy day mm -hmm. or my mind is, you know, on something negative and maybe it's even personal. Um, mm -hmm. I need to be aware that like, that that's going to affect everyone in the room in different ways and probably um, affect people in unintentional way, have a, have a greater effect unintentionally. And so it's just mm. things I've been thinking about with regard to um, as we get bigger, you know, what is that? Like, what, what is the best way I can be for making Kinex successful? So yeah, uh, and I think mindfulness is one of those. Well, good. Well, it's good you're reflecting on all of that. And then before we jump into the plan questions, I'm going to just close the loop a little bit on, okay, the chat is working. Okay. And, you know, I think what we're, what, what's happening here is um, we've, there, there, there was a problem. Somebody, if you will, pulled the and on cord and thank you to the, the person or people who spoke up. And Greg, thank you for having that back channel. Because obviously people can't send a chat saying, hey, chat's broken. Yeah, yeah. Um, or chat's not set up properly. So. Uh, to me, like in problem solving language here, we we contained the problem, right? It was identified, we acknowledged it, we we fixed, we put the fire out, short-term countermeasure. But then, you know, the long-term countermeasure is to absolutely go back to the Zoom setup and double check, you know, is there a default that I thought was on that wasn't mm -hmm. on and or building it or both, you know, uh, putting it into um, the checklist, long-term countermeasure. So I cannot recommend, I'm a, CEO of a technology company. Something about paper, though, still um, works really well. So, anyway, here's the checklist. We could no, build not, checklists in yeah. our own instance of the kind they of do. software. Not, a, re yeah. a recurring checklist we would use for each of these, right? Right. And not to say that it couldn't be done, but sometimes I just want to have something in my hand that I can cross out. So, well, when people talk about running their company on spreadsheets, I mean, this. Is, I mean, we don't quote unquote run the company on spreadsheets, but we're using a spreadsheet. We're right. using Google Sheets, and and that is the technology that people are using a lot of times before uh, they come into Kinexus. Not to get That's too true. deep into that, so yeah. we can we can look at that. We do use our Kinexus platform uh, quite a bit. I will mention, and um, well, let me ask it as a question, Greg, before we get to other people's questions. So we log in. We we should share a screenshot publicly, like our instance gets customized every month with like a really fun theme. And, and right now that theme is, is very Halloween. That's based. scary. I mean, it's like, just downright how, scary. How, how, how did that get to be Greg? Well, it's, it's funny Mark. there is a super secret theme team that every month changes <laughs> the theme on Kinexus. And what they're doing is using all of our, our branding functionality um, to use it in really creative ways. And in the spirit of the super secret, I really don't know exactly who's on the team. It's a surprise um, to you. Some, I, I could make some oh. guesses, but it is truly a surprise to me. And so. So you can't even. OK, so I thought you were going to say, say I wasn't listening. I thought you were going to say you don't know what the theme is going to be. You can't even go apply pressure, positional pressure as CEO. Right. To tell them what the theme should be. Oh, I that would be definitely <laughs> stifling creativity. I mean, let's come on, Mark. We know that the people at Kinex are way more creative than I am. So yeah, that would be it's pretty cool. Every the first of every month's always fun because it, it goes live on the first, and uh, and they even get down into uh, making everyone's avatar uh, theme appropriate. And so I am Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, um, the old school, not the deaf one um, no. this month. And I think that's very appropriate. So, so here, let me, and, and, and I, I, I am going to screen share real quick yeah. because there'll be a video recording of this. Um, not to get, I'm sorry to, you know, we won't get distracted on this, this very long, but here, here's when I log in to our Kinexus instance of Kinexus, you know, we see uh, the fun Halloween theme up here. We see spooky Ophi as kind of, you know, our mascot and character and Ophi, OFI opportunity for improvement. And 
and this is fun. So if we if we have customers watching this, Greg, like who who would they talk to if they want to do similar fun things uh, with their own instance? Yeah, I mean, talk to their talk to their CSM, talk to their SE. Honestly, a lot of this stuff they could probably do themselves, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's a great way. I and mean, we're using it to highlight a bunch of things. And a lot of people at Kind Access will will look at this the first time, and then they will change their default board because their default board is pressure to them. It's how they jump off into a lot of their workflows. And so it doesn't always have to stick like that. And, um, but that's, you have to have a lot of creativity, but I, I, we've seen that being used in lots of different ways. At least an announcements card would be a, um, a no brainer for a lot of places to take advantage of. All right. Well, cool. Um, All right. So we have some questions that have come in from the audience. There are questions we're going to cover here today related to Kinexus, the company, continuous improvement, leadership, culture, like there's such an interesting mix of questions. We'll start off with one that's kind of a fun get to know us question. Um, Maybe, you know, short answer to it. What was your dream job when you were a kid? And I'll say, Greg, I hope one of those was either ER doc or you probably didn't dream of being a software company founder and CEO, but what was your dream job? I I take it you're getting a um, first mover advantage in that you get to uh, allow me to answer it first. Um, yeah, so my, I really have no memory of a dream job per se, but I feel though very early I was thinking uh, about being a doctor. Definitely didn't know what kind of doctor. Honestly, you know, my earliest memories would have been in the early 80s about this and emergency medicine really was in its infancy as a specialty. So mm-hmm. it would have even been hard to have known. I do remember where I was the first time I heard about ER as a specialty, and I was already in med school by then. Um, I was in my my first semester for several months of medical school when I kind of found out about the specialty and, and what that meant. So um, I don't know if that's my you know, dream job, but it was certainly something I had been thinking about really deeply for many, many, many years. What about you, Mark? Oh, that's cool. Um, I had one, there's one I've talked about. Let me give you two real quick. So one, when I was in elementary school, my dream job was to be what they call a beat writer who would travel with a baseball team like the Detroit Tigers. I grew up in Detroit. I would have never thought of this as a job, but one of my best friends in elementary school, his dad, that was his job. And I love baseball. His dad got to travel with the team, got to go to all the, he got paid to be a baseball fan as I viewed it, but then, and then write about the games. Um, you know, so that, that was one dream job as I got a little bit older, I, I was really into music and I had a dream job of being um, a percussionist, more specifically a, a timpani player with an orchestra. And I decided not to pursue music as a career. I did not know that about I you. I was a weird kid with a lot of different interests. How about that? Yeah. So, all right, we've covered that. Um, Greg, you know, there's a question for you and we haven't done one of these since last December. Yeah. Um, so maybe, you know, as a follow-up, um, someone's wondering, are you all fully back in the office now? And and if so, um, what COVID safety precautions are you still taking today? Then uh, being October 2022. Sure. So we, as you may or may, I know you know this, Mark, but as other people may or may not know, we uh, basically dissolved the Austin office um, pretty early in the pandemic. It was just it aligned with our our lease commitments, and uh, had started to look back to to getting into an office um, almost nine months ago, and then the the Omicron. Um, surge happened and that delayed things, but we opened up July 1, I think was, it was official. And uh, now we have a really, I mean, pretty amazing, I think, uh, 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 headquarters. Uh, I'd love to say corporate headquarters, just to jab the Dallas uh, folks um, office here in in Austin. And it's definitely a hybrid situation. Uh, we don't have any rules um, about um, you know if and when you come in. Um, Right now, we just don't really see them as being necessary. I, I'm always never want to close doors on and on if we'll do that in the future. But right now, it seems to be working really well. Where um, I would say there are some people that never come in, and then there's some people that come in every day, mm-hmm. and then there's you know everything in between. And so it's a uh, it's a it's a really cool space. Yeah. So other than the, the wall behind you, which is still like to be decorated, you've right? not done. So it's it's a mixture of some kind of open work areas and collaborative work areas. And then these individual rooms where people can be on meetings and whatnot. And the individual rooms have not been decorated quite yet. So as a, a, a random idea, uh, at some point, maybe someone could 
like do a, a tour of the new Dallas office, just like, or not the, I'm sorry, the new Austin office. There's also the group in Dallas who's had their office for a while, but like just even do like just kind of an iPhone walkthrough. It might be fun It'd to be show fun, yeah. people that space because out in the main area, you know, there, there's a lot of personality um, that comes through and it's, it, it is a cool space. Um, one other question here, I think related, and, and, and this will be the end of the COVID talk. Um, thoughts on timing to get the new Omicron booster? Who should get it? How do we think through that? And there maybe is an yeah. answer, but. So in to give context, early in the pandemic, I became very interested in, in all the science related to it. In we as a company um, did, did a bunch of kind of ask us anything related to the pandemic and um, started. I started to do a blog about it. It ultimately morphed into letters to humans, and over the last year or so, I just really haven't written much on it. So um, I spend quite a bit of time, still not as much as before, Mark, but still, you know, a reasonable amount of time keeping up with things. And um, yeah, so with regard to um, the boosters, I think I think we're really at a point in the pandemic where we're probably closer to being pre-pandemic than we've ever been. And uh, I think the data is really clear that this is a three shot um, series. Um, and then, uh, you know, fourth shots and beyond become far less important for people not in high risk um, groups. So if you're not in the uh, over 65 other health medical problems or in an immunocompromised state, um, it's still recommended. I would follow CDC guidelines, but it's probably not as important um, if you um, keep up with that. And, and I say that because really those initial um, shots are, are um, they have really good protection and durable protection and broad protection against a lot of the, or really all the variants with regard to protecting you against severe disease, hospitalization, death. Mm -hmm. I think everyone knows that the amount of protection they give you against getting the infection has has plummeted, and and really, I think it's we just need to re, refocus um, and, or the framework of what, what are we trying to accomplish with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so, I had COVID in June, so I'm waiting for my booster, which would be my fourth shot, mm -hmm. um, till six months after that. So I'll be looking to do it probably in, in late October or November. And uh, I'm 47. I have high blood pressure well controlled so if someone in my state said hey greg i don't think i really want to do sh shots after the third shot i'd say cool you know it's up to you you know mm -hmm. i think if you're visiting um if you if you're um have more medical problems if you really want to try to prevent getting the infection cuz it those boosters really do prevent you for a while so you're you got to stretch a time that you really can't get sick, <laughs> um, then then that would be uh, you might want to reconsider that. But th that's kind of my approach and thought process at this yeah. point. And if you know if people are watching this as, as these things change and evolve, probably good advice: check the CDC guidelines. Talk to your doctor based on your own health and family around you and other situations. Right? Yeah. I mean, I have a 96 year old grandmother, and um, my folks are in one of those three high risk categories. So. You know, I'm, I think it's a much stronger <laughs> recommendation um, than if you're a 30 year old person with no medical problems. So, okay. Well, thanks, Greg. Yeah. Um, so here, here's a question that came in. Um, Kathy, it was, uh, I don't always remember to look at the name here. Kathy, if you're watching, thanks for your question. Um, what do you think are the most common mistakes when implementing Kanban? And how would you mitigate them? And, and, and I'm going to take this question and maybe let, let's just generalize it. Because you, you could plug and play that same question, copy and paste, search and replace Kanban with 5S or whatever lean method. So maybe, you know, let's just talk about this more generally. I mean, like three, three things come to mind. Um, I don't know if they're most common, but they're common. So let me run through three real quick and then bounce it to you, Greg. I think one is starting with the tool saying we are going to implement this tool instead of framing it as what problem are we solving? So even back to Kanban, and, and Kanban, this could refer to um, the flow of parts in a factory at a hospital, or it could refer to the planning method that's often sticky notes on the wall, or people can do Kanban in Kinexus. But like, what, what are we trying to accomplish by using this tool? Like, I think 
your odds of um, a tool not having impact or people giving up on it is when it feels like we're implementing it just to implement it. We should be doing this. Other companies are doing this. You've got to frame it to either what's the problem or what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, two, I think not, you know, like being too rigid in how you're using the tool. I think there's a trap of people saying, well, we have to do it this exact way because this other company does it that way, or someone taught me to do it that way. Like you might be taught a starting point, but then adapt and adjust uh, based on your own learning and your own needs. And so I always encourage people don't, don't be too, too rigid. And then third rule would be not engaging enough people in like if we were to think of this, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would always try to point people back to an A3 problem solving process. So are we engaging people in understanding the need for change, the current condition, the gaps in performance? When we engage people early on about defining and understanding the problem and then engage them in deciding what countermeasures or tools are we going to use, you, you're, you're doing a better job of bringing people along through the process instead of a small group of people deciding we're going to go implement this. And now we're trying to implement it. And then we hear, how do we gain buy-in from people? It might be too late at that point. So the, you know, uh, try to gain buy-in early and often. As they yeah, I think say. it's interesting. I When I looked at the question, I'm, I'm glad you went first because you, you're right on the Kanban. We don't even know what kind of Kanban Ron <laughs> Kathy was talking right. about. So I'm glad you generalized it. And, and, I wrote down three things that I, I uh, that I, I I think could be added to this that uh, would you would just take, uh, add more color. Probably could be thought of as um, um, just a really general kind of almost change management, but I, I think it's just so important to start with why. Like, mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? Which I think is another way of saying is mm -hmm. what's the problem you know that we're trying to solve? Or what's the and opportunity? So I'd also like to say before we go on, I mean, for this entire hour, Mark and I are going to talk about things. And, and just because we say, oh, this is the way it should be done, doesn't mean we're always perfect at, at doing these things. Mm -hmm. And we're always having to self-correct and someone will bring something up and go, oh, yes, I'm not following that principle. Thank you for thank you for being uh, allowing me to 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 get better. But I always so so start with why mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote down. Um, don't let um, better be the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think sometimes you just have to start on something and mm -hmm. and and let it evolve from there, and then make it easy. I think if you yeah. are teaching something new to somebody and you make it a fifteen step process that has a uh, you know multiple sub you know, topics and tasks and oh, but if it's on Tuesday, we're going to use this. And I mean, just try to make it as easy as possible, and then build from there. So th I would I would add that to. Um, some of the comments you made. Yeah. I mean, one, one other thing I was going to add here, um, you know, al along the lines of, uh, you know, I think we both touched on something maybe related to what's often called scientific problem solving. Instead of saying, I know we need to implement that solution, lean thought process or A3 problem solving process would, would take you more through a process of understanding the problem. And then, and I know this language sounds torturous at, at, at times, but we, instead of saying, we're going to go implement the solution that we know is going to work, the mindset is more of, we have a hypothesis that if we test this countermeasure, we will see positive results that we predicted without huge side effects, right? We're, we go and right. test a countermeasure or we're testing the way we do it. And we've got to be open to the possibility of um, there's something we didn't anticipate or We've learned something new. Let's go back and adjust. That, that's at least a vaguely scientific problem-solving process. But at the same time, like the, the idea that we can iterate our way to good, um, we, we could get tripped up where um, like there's a time and a place for doing a little bit of research, right? There, there's some science or there's some knowledge that we could use as a basis for our scientific experiments. Um, I think a lot of it's really situational, right? We don't want to research it to death. Right, right. We don't want to be afraid to try something. But at the same time, like, especially in an organization, if, if we're given permission to go try something, it's hard to get a second chance sometimes. Right? That, that That's maybe not how it should be 
but maybe it, that's how it is for people in some organizations, in some mm-hmm. cultures. You, you, you know, what's the right amount of research without doing too much? And then how do we go and try something that's not 100% guaranteed to work without being reckless? Like there's there's middle ground, right? And I think that's where being in a company with high trust helps because mm-hmm. people just trust that people are kind of, I don't want to say doing the best they can, but like doing the best they can. And it's not, right. and I think that, but I think it's so interesting the my background in being a physician has helped mm-hmm. in just ingrain the kind of that scientific thinking because the entire history, you know, um, physical and then, you know, developing a differential and you know, but that entire thought process is, is a little bit of a scientific, um, you know, methodology in, in practice. So you don't want to sit there and ask three questions and then go, okay, I know what's wrong with you. And we're going to do that. Right. But you also can't say, oh, we're going to ask 3000 questions because <laughs> we can't go forever. And so kind of finding that balance where you, you feel, I think is a, an important thing. Um, I, I want to also just throw out maybe a, a third thing, fourth thing is, is make it obvious. So um, I have dry eyes, uh, people that are looking at monitors all day. And um, you, when you don't treat your dry eyes, you actually see more poorer. So mm-hmm. my eyes watch like, you got to use this stuff, you know, five, six times a day. And so I always forgot. And then I make it obvious because it's sitting here on my desk. And then I remember as soon as I feel the symptom. Of it. Anyway, so and make I, saw it obvious. You, I saw you use them and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, it's just maybe you know, one other question to you back to the idea of being a doctor. If somebody came into you or came into a primary care physician saying, well, I want to implement this countermeasure. Like I know a lot of people on medication for high blood pressure. I want right, that right. too. Like you're going to go back and understand what's the problem or even is there a problem before you yep. would try a countermeasure, right? That's a great, I love that analogy. That's a perfect, you know, that's like, I, I feel like I've heard some people use the analogy of the op- ophthalmologist saying, oh, well, oh, you're not, you're, you don't see well. Oh, cool. Well, I've got these glasses here. See if they work, you know? Yeah. versus you know doing an exam and getting data and understanding current condition um before you prescribe or or you know test anyway yeah. i love that. Yeah. or and, and with a lot of medications there is a bit of a pdsa process around dosing and like i've been on a statin medication for cholesterol for uh a while and you know there there's an adjustment of like you would try a small dose and if that's not having enough of an effect you're probably hopefully doing other countermeasures related to to diet and exercise but this could be genetic, so then maybe you have to adjust the dose. You figure it out, right? You notice we didn't start with a large dose, so that could that could kind of talk a little bit about the combine, um, you know, question. Just you know, going overboard as your initial first step. If you were wrong, the effects of being wrong are going to be greater versus, you know. Yeah. So that comes back to the idea of small test of change. I would always recommend instead of rolling a tool out company wide as a big bang. Well, you got to start somewhere. And like get those early lessons learned at a point where it's not as quote unquote embarrassing, right? Learn and and, and adjust and refine and then start spreading that practice that's been refined while realizing it's still not perfect and we're we're gonna have continued improvement loops. So um, this is kind of related. I mean, we're talking about uh, mistakes people might make implementing a tool. Um, There's a question, maybe it's somebody who listens um, Gratuitous plug, my favorite mistake podcast. Greg has been a guest on that podcast. So, you know, the question here is, um, how would how do you, Greg, as a CEO, think about creating a culture of learning from mistakes? How important is that to you? And what what are some of the things that you do as a leader? Yeah, so I, I, it's 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 interesting because I think when th- there's a lot of ways to tackle. So one, I I think that. I, Many years ago, I kind of in the the software kind of uh, lore slash um, information to read about. They talk about oh, you know, mistakes are wonderful, and um, I'll only invest in someone that's had a couple failed startups first. And and I'm I'm always very like um, off putish to that. I'm always like mm-hmm. yeah, mistakes suck. I mean, let's be honest. Like no one ever wants to make a mistake, right? And so the the difference between um, I think taking a mistake and uh, um, making a negative thing versus making it positive 
is your thought process on it, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think, why growth mindset is, is one of our values. And mm -hmm. so if you are a fixed mindset and you make a mistake, then the interpretation of that is I'm an awful person. I'm not right. good at these. I'm um, sloppy. I'm sloppy. Um, and, and and it's like almost in a personal front. Oh, we are a bad company. We couldn't get this right, right? Versus a growth mindset would take a mistake and look at that and go, oh, wow. Well, I mean, I, I learned something here. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do this again um, differently? And so um, it's really interesting. I was, uh, oh, I'm very proud, but we just scored a five out of five on our penetration test. So as you may or may not know, software companies mm -hmm. hire other companies to try to break into the system just to see, you know, how good our security is. And I was uh, telling it to my family mm -hmm. and I was describing that, you know, part of the testing is um, there's a, the, you know, the social hacking and then there's, the, you know, the penetration hacking. And, you know, I explained, um, I explained, oh yeah, well, you know, last year um, the social um, test, um, they, they, they caught us, they got it, they got in. And, and my daughter, my guest was like, what happened to the person that I'm allowed to do that? And I was like, mm. I don't, I don't know. What do you mean? What happened to the person? Like, well, did you, did you fire her or is she no longer working? And I was just like, Micah, no, like uh -huh. this, what, like we all learned from it. Like, you right. know, like this was, this was a, a, a really amazing thing, you know, that, that happened that we, um, if, if, if we wouldn't have had that quote mistake, yeah. right. Um, if we wouldn't have, I don't want to say celebrate it, but like really well, highlighted and said, oh, good, we can all learn from this. Then two things happen. One, that person, you know, feels like not only horrible, even because they already feel that much more horrible, but it, it becomes a hiding kind of culture, right? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to let anyone know. But then, um, but then two, yeah, there, there's like the, the learning of that. So right. I think, I don't know if I'm answering your question, yeah. but, but these are kind of the well, ways I'm thinking through that. Well, so there's a couple things I was going to say, but then I want to come back to the question of, well, so one thing you're doing is, well, you're, you're sharing stories. So I guess talking to Kinexus people about how you think about mistakes is trying to influence them, yep. um, I think, in a good way here. And um, the reaction in that moment, like that's that's leading by example of not making a big show of firing that person and giving them a box and dragging them out to the street. And then that would send a message, uh, you know, um, of, of, of mistakes being in, you know, intolerable. But, you know, I think there's this balance here. Like you, you, there's this thing about celebrating mistakes. If there's a connection to learning, that should be celebrated. We wouldn't repeat making the same mistake over and over again. Right. Great point. We yeah. should be learning and creating a culture where we can learn. And then I, I think if you if you err too far on the side of punishing mistakes, that drives problems underground, then mm -hmm. you can't improve. And then you might literally be repeating the same mistake over and over again because nobody even dares recognize that. And you know, we all make mistakes, like you said. Well, it, by the definition of the word, people didn't mean to do that. If it was intentional, we would call that sabotage. And that right. might be a fireable offense, you know, but um, recognizing and finding this balance of almost just expecting mistakes are going to happen to prepare yourself for how you would react when you make a mistake or you work with somebody else and they make a mistake. And then there's the more complicated situations of quote unquote, systemic mistakes, systemic errors. So those are a couple of thoughts you you know that 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 came to mind for me. But maybe let me bounce it back to you. Like, how do you think through? Okay, like back to your, the point at the beginning. Whether you like it or not, you have this position of CEO and co-founder. People look to you. Um, what 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 do you do as a, a CEO to try to create that sort of mindset, the growth mindset, even more broadly? I mean, I think. One there there's that direct coaching, but I. I really, I'm in constant, um, I'm constantly striving to, to, to lead by example or by teaching. And, um, um, one of the things, you know, I, th I think probably a lot of people here at kind of have seen me do it. And, and sometimes I'm, I'm doing it intentionally and sometimes I'm just doing it because it's who I am, but mm -hmm. 
I've apologized to people. I mean, um, I uh, just about four to six weeks ago, I treated someone really poorly um, and I was not proud of it. And still in the moment of that meeting, I, I could not go on with, um, and I just stopped it. And I just said, hey, I want to um, apologize. That was a totally inappropriate way for me to treat you. And it was not called for and please accept my apology. And so I, I felt proud of myself for saying that Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I think a five year ago version of myself would have kind of just brushed it off and moved on and and not really realized, but, um, anyway, so I think leading by example, that's my, that's my story. Well, and, and, and what you're describing there shows growth, right. To think about how I might've handled it in the past and, you know, I think I think there's an important component of owning your role in something, even if there are systemic factors, right? So if 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 you acted in a way that clearly upset somebody, a different person in that same situation might say, "Well, they're too sensitive, right? They just deflect and blame them." Now that person might be sensitive, and if that were really true, then maybe you know, should you adjust your behavior? Right. You know, you can't change who you are, but, you know, you need to keep that in mind. You know, don't blame, don't deflect, you know, um, let's say, you know, that person was having a really bad day. Well, that was maybe a contributing factor, not your fault. Like on a different day, they might have reacted differently. But still, like, I think it's healthy to say, well, there might have been other factors involved, but here's what I did. I can reflect and I can try to grow, right? Uh, so I think that's important. I think if you want to develop a culture of growth mindset, if you want to develop a culture of we're learning from our, our mistakes, when senior leaders make a mistake, whether big or small, I think it it really reflects um, and into you know people like us do things like this to to um, to do that. And quite frankly, I think if if people think less of you. Or doing that, it's probably not people you want to lead. Mm. Um, and so uh, that's another kind of thing to think through. So I think it's one thing if you were literally you know, making a mistake every five minutes and apologize. I mean, it's just like, come on, you know, um, yeah. but uh, you can take you can take anything to its extreme and it it has the opposite effect. <laughs> um, but if it's, it's if it's being done in a um, in a, an authentic way and uh, um and if it's being done in just in an authentic way, I'll just say that because you could look at that like how public was it, how long did it take, what was the appropriate way to handle it. If it's just done in an authentic way, then I think it um, people see that. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, all right, let's move on to another question. Um, this came in from from Clint. With the work that you do, you know, how do you? you, you let me try to rephrase it. You, you can count things like how many customers you have. You can count things like how many people are using the system. How, how do you know the impact that your customers are having, the impact you're having on them as yeah. customers? Yeah, so two, two cool milestones, but I'll, I'll answer your, your question directly. When, we, when we're reporting on the impact, so we just crossed an amazing milestone. You, 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 you set that up uh, very nicely for me to, to kind of mention that. But we've crossed 5 billion of impact that is logged in our system. And, and That's when we, five billion the B, dollars, correct? U.S. dollars, um, and I think we do our, I think we do our best to try to. We are obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but we're we're tracking impact in many different currencies because we have uh, about thirty to forty percent of our customers are international and they're doing business in lots of different currencies. But it's really a an accumulation and um, of 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 adding up all of the impacts that our customers have put in with regard to their um, improvement work. So it's pretty cool because it's not an estimation of what we think uh, Kinexus um, uh, organizations uh, put in, but it's literally what they've logged. And so mm-hmm. the other the other kind of cool milestone that I will I'll flex and, and share is we, we crossed 1 million completed items in the system um, in the month of September of this past and, September. And, and items would include, like kind of in the origins of Kinexus 11, 12 years ago, an opportunity for improvement. But that those items could include A3s and projects. projects or, Mac or charts or um, and even tasks are, are added as, as items, literally 
because the system is so configurable, as you know, Mark, we can't kind of differentiate every organization does different um, kind of templates, but um, it's uh, it includes all of those things, but then it's 1 million. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And, 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 and those, those numbers are on our website and they get updated fairly often. I know it's not a real time. Yeah, I think about quarterly. Quarter, I think there's quarterly. Like yeah. 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 So I encourage people to go look at that if they're interested And there. There's a, a maybe, you know, side question. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it. Something we've talked about, you know, for a long time. So, you know, customers are reporting their own impact of improvements and it's not just cost savings, it's quality and safety and categorized and quantified in, in, in different ways. The 5 billion number just happens to be a very noticeable, right. just, you know, crossing that threshold recently. But it comes back to the question of like, how much of the improvement or how much of the benefit comes from the three things that we, we talk about, like, you know, the, the methodologies, the leadership and the technology, it's kind of all intertwined. It's hard to sort out, right? How much of it is because they're, they're using software? Oh yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, we're, we're not forcing anyone to use Kinex, right? People are coming to us or, or so it, there's, there's certainly a, um, there's going to be a factor of, well, what would these organizations have done without kind access? Um, and you could have that. Um, we, what's, what's really cool is when, when, when organizations have that back data and they end up, we end up importing that in. So they have their baseline. And then to see that inflection point of when they start, um, uh, rolling out kind access, it is, uh, it's pretty magical to see. It's really cool. And then you talk to those uh, uh, the CI professionals that are, um, I'll say, um, big drivers of, of, of spreading it, um, and and their their whole face just lights up and and about about how really it's a leverage. Um, and so really, yeah, I mean, you have to have that methodology, and you have to have those leadership behaviors. Otherwise, the technology would would literally do nothing. Um, I just wanted to touch about one other point on the impact that I think is cool is that we are, we just, in one of the recent releases, we just added uh, the ability to start tracking things like, um, I mean, you could, you could do it before. You just couldn't do it as elegantly um, CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of um, uh, manufacturing or we have mining organizations that are really trying to decrease their environmental impact and they want to, and report about on the, uh, report on that in in really specific ways, and so um, yeah, we're not talking about safety, satisfaction, environmental impact, or the the benefit of the you know um, these changes. So it's 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 pretty cool to be involved in um, kind of creating this positive um, change in in different places yeah. around the world. Yeah. Well, that is great. You can measure what tons of uh, CO two would be. A measure of that? That's the one. That's the yeah. one they keep. Yeah, they, yeah. There, there's no um, true elegant way to do that. Or you could yeah. you could even measure, you know, in a lot of these, you know, I'll just give an example. In, in mining process, they need they need to use water, for instance. Um, and uh, if you figured out a improvement on a process to decrease the amount of water you needed, you, that would be, you know, an, mm -hmm. an, a resource improvement. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. And um yeah, I mean, the way I, I guess, you know, I think through it, there there are improvements that are happening that never get tabulated or they, they get tabulated in ways that are hard to aggregate, yeah. roll up and aggregate. So Kinex certainly has that function. But then I think there's a piece where it's not just better tracking the improvement. There, there's the collaboration that's happening as improvements are being worked on. You know, you, you could argue, and I think in a lot of cases where through better communication, through better visibility, by bringing people in that would be difficult to involve. Otherwise, you're 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 aiming for better improvement, like more effective improvement, more of it. And then there's the spread factor, which maybe comes back then to you know kind of logging and tabulating and and, and sharing ideas across an organization of like you know seeing problems, solving problems, and sharing what you've done, you know, kind of access really kind of helps people see what they've reported, work on the solving and then share what you've yeah, done. Yeah, perfectly said. I said that not as a salesperson, but that's my attempt at, um, you know, that's kind of you know, what, what, what we hear customers talking about in yeah. terms of how they're using it. So, um, all right. So let, let, here's another question here. This is from Charles. What is more important than 
a cultural transformation from top management down to the people on the shop floor before implementing lean and using lean tools. So uh, the way I, the way I'm reading that question is, you know, I guess it's making a statement. There's maybe proposing there's nothing more important than cultural transformation from top management down to the shop floor. But then, so here's I think the part that's interesting of like how before implementing lean, like it's a chicken and egg, yes, scenario here, right? Yes. Because culture change, yet alone transformation, is not like flipping a, a, a light switch. It's a process. It's a journey, you know. It's 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 more, I think, an iterative thing where the culture change comes from people being inspired enough that we need to change, learning enough to then go start trying some things, mm-hmm. and then how do you how do you roll that out? Having the yeah. having the air co- cover or the psychological safety to 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 try these things. I mean, yeah. I think. Seth Godin's definition of culture comes to mind here. You know, people like us do things like this. Yeah. Um, it was, oh, if there's nothing more important than being a runner before you um, do a marathon. Well, yeah. Yeah. What, what do runners do? They, they run, they, they're like, they, so there's this, um, I, I, I think the, the important thing here is what I'm hearing is cultural transformations. So we're going to do a, a behavior in a repetitive way at an organization is going to have to include the senior leadership. Now, whether that's the senior leadership of a team or um, a, a plant or a hospital, I mean, there is very hard to execute this um, completely from a ground up um, um, method. So I, I think that's the, I think that's the kind of important thing. I think now, you're going to be using lean tools in order to do that. And hopefully you're picking simple ones that um, can be, you know, utilized in wide varieties of areas. And then you're doing all the things that we mentioned in two prior or three prior questions are you're not doing those mistakes. But I, I think there's the only way to have a cultural transformation is to start doing that work and, and or have the management give that air cover and, and show the importance, but then going beyond that and getting involved a bit. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, back to the, the, the chicken and egg thing here, I think there are times when culture change or small instances of a little bit of culture change can become a driver of being able to quote unquote, do lean things, mm-hmm. right? So what culture and, and mindset do you need to have in place to, let's say, if you're in a factory uh, effectively utilize an andon cord system. You, you know, and there are stories in the, you know, of plants that have installed this equipment and then it was a waste of money because unlike the Toyota culture where you pull the andon cord and there's this response from, from leaders of how do we help? In some environments, if you install that equipment and somebody pulls the cord and they get yelled at for potentially stopping the line, the you know, you say like, yeah. you know, this, 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 some of this goes, you know, maybe there are some elements of culture that you need to have in place before implementing some sort of lean method, or you would test it and then identify the culture gap and then go work on that. But I think you could anticipate some of those those culture gaps that could get in the way. But then culture change is also a result of doing lean things, like engaging people in structured continuous improvement. You don't need to have a perfect lean culture to start doing, you know, plan, do, study, adjust mode right. improvement. Um, and you, you know, you've got to have enough leeway or the right culture to let people try things that, quote unquote, don't work. Right. And, you know, if, if the PDSA cycles are not a cycle, if it's a straight path of here's the things we implemented, maybe you're just wrapping different language around the same old uh, improvement attempts you had before. So it, I mean, it's, it's a, it's an interesting question. It, it, I think it just goes to show a lot of this is, uh, it's just a matter of, it goes hand in hand. I don't Wait, think it could, if, if it was, you know, there is nothing more important than getting leadership buy-in and or leadership behaviors to facilitate doing lean on the shop floor, utilizing lean tools, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And so the, the, I would agree with that statement wholeheartedly. I mean, there's, uh, I'm not going to say it's completely futile because uh-huh. there will be some good that happens from it, but I think, yeah, from a sustainability standpoint, it's futile. 
if you're going to try to do something on the shop floor, but the management and or leader level of that plant is is not understanding what's what's about to go down. I mean, they will 100% stop it because, yeah, in, in a place that doesn't have that mentality of, oh, let me come help, then why is the why is the line stopping? <laughs> yeah. If we're not going to go like fix something or improve something, then don't stop it. If we're just going to go yell at people, you know? Well, and, and it comes back to that culture of responding appropriately to problems or mistakes or however you frame it. So let's say if someone's working on an assembly line and you go to grab a part and it slips out of your hands and falls on the floor. That would be a classic moment to reach up and pull the and on cord because now you've fallen behind in your work. You have to grab another part. Maybe that part's sitting there. It's a tripping hazard. So now you have to address it. You've fallen behind in your work. And that's where you, know, you would pull the and on cord to say, okay, something went wrong. And then a team leader responds. And there, there might be, this comes back to short-term countermeasures. So like, okay, I'm going to get that dropped part out of the way. Let me get you another one. Um, okay, we recovered and the line never stopped, or you stop the line long enough to put quality and safety first and get back on track. If you didn't have that help culture, culture of helping, somebody might feel pressure to, I dropped that part, oh God, I can't get in trouble. I'm gonna put it on the car anyway, right? Now you might be creating a defect that flows downstream. It might even get all the way to the customer. And I think that's part of the, the damage that occurs when 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 the, there's a culture that pressures people into hiding mistakes and like you know then, then you might come back and do a, a longer term countermeasure. Let's say the part's just hard to grab. It just gets in like if you've gotten a little bit sweaty and it slips out of your hand real easily, you might need to um, give people gloves or you might redesign the part to be a little bit easier to hold on to because what you don't want to be doing is constantly reacting to the same problem all day long. At some point you would. You would stop or even at the end of the shift say, okay, now we need to do something closer to some root cause problem solving so that we can prevent that from happening again. So I just thought of something. It's kind of related to what you're talking about, but a little different. So as part of the checklist, one of the things is to put a sign on the door that says webinar in progress. Mm -hmm. And literally 45 seconds before we're about to start, yeah. someone opened the door and I said, didn't you see the sign? Right? which obviously that person saw the sign, they wouldn't have come in. <laughs> so I'm thinking huh. through it and I'm thinking, maybe I'm putting the sign in the wrong place. What if I put the sign and I just taped it right over the door handle? So for yeah. you to open the door, you would literally need to touch the, you, you see where yeah. I'm going with yeah. that? Well, that, 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 that that's didn't sort you, of um, some, didn't some you mistake. Didn't you more terrible? <laughs> exactly, mistake proofing. It's yeah. mistake proofing. Because it would be easy to say, well, they should have seen the sign. Correct. Correct. Well, okay, well, fine. I mean, there's lots of should and shouldn'ts. And, um, but so yeah, then I, there's, I, the, yeah, there's a mistake. I, I went to blame. Right? So I, do I, um, I blame person? Oh, well, didn't you read the sign? Instead right. of thinking, oh, well, there's an opportunity because that person obviously doesn't want to interrupt me during a webinar. Like, what, what could we have done better to have made it more visible that that yeah. was happening? I know it was just an interesting. Yeah. Well, so the the the, the short-term countermeasure was um, get out, which that's not what you said, you know, but like, okay, you know, d d we hadn't started yet, so it wasn't really an interruption. But if somebody yeah. came in and started talking, you would say, okay, wait, no, okay, you know, um, short-term countermeasure uh, would be be quiet and get out of the room. And then, yeah, I think you're right to come back then to what could we do to really prevent that? Like, I think just yeah. telling yeah. people, be careful is an ineffective strategy. Putting the sign directly over the the uh, the, the doorknob would be better. Here, here's one other um, you know thing that I've done when it comes to the webinars. Um, there's there's always a risk that I forget to click record. Now, one countermeasure, and this is probably the better countermeasure, is to set Zoom to automatically start recording, and then I just edit out the part that's not formally the webinar. I know how right. to do that. It creates risk, and now I'm. This is why I'm, I'm trying to be proactive, and maybe I should go back and make this change to the process, because there's that risk of not hitting record. What I've done in the past, instead of having a note on my desk that says record, I've put that right on my trackpad, right? Because I'm going to interact with that trackpad, and it's very similar to you putting a sign over the door handle. I'm going to touch and the 
I'm not recording, let me hit record. I would at least catch the problem, but I think, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and look at the Zoom settings, not just on um, allowing chat to everybody, but, but I, I should turn on that auto record feature. We're learning and we're growing, right? I love it. I'm not a it. bad webinar host, I'm growing as a webinar host, how's that? I think we can knock out one more. We can. Uh, is there a question that some of these questions are hard to address in a short period of time? Well, here, okay, let, let, let's, let's, um, I'm going to pull a question forward and we'll hold some other questions. And um, so that here, here's a question about, uh, where'd it go? Okay. Um, this is a question that came in uh, from Joe. Joe in Michigan, um, I know which Joe this is. Um, is there value for companies in expanding resources further into their communities? Mm -hmm. I think we'd say this is related to, to lean or to, to foster deeper ties to influence culture change that would be beneficial uh, for people outside the company. Is that an option in the US? And, and so, like for me, what thought a couple things come to mind. You know, one is companies that do pro bono improvement work for others, you know, nonprofits in their communities. Uh, Toyota comes to mind. They have a nonprofit group called the TSSC that goes out, works with food banks and nonprofit health systems, and 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 they're they're giving back. They 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 use language like you know they're 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 giving back to society by teaching what they know about improvement and process design and problem solving. Um, we tried that a little bit. I'm, I'm also thinking back to uh, Vaxinexus. We tried yeah, yeah. offering up some software. I, don't think, I think we successfully. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we so, successfully. so 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 talk yeah. about that before we wrap. Yeah, up. I mean, we we created an instance of Kinexus where people were sharing. And this is go back to um, so December 2020 was when they initially approved uh, the vaccine, and then. People remember that first three to six months, increasing the um, way people were uh, de delivering the vaccine, um, both in a supply chain standpoint, as well as uh, vaccine clinics and whatnot. There was a lot of learning that had to happen. And so we facilitated a lot of that. And I think it, it, it died down after you know five or six months when that initial surge of people wanting vaccines kind of got more in a steady state that that healthcare could help, but um, that was a lot of fun. In fact, uh, and Maggie Millar, our VP of uh, Customer Experience, was really, really involved in that and uh, kind of moderated that site and it got mm -hmm. people connected and, and all sorts of things, so. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, and that was offered up free uh, to, to people and we had users in the US and Canada from different organizations. And, you know, I think it was good to try to help Others, but then you know it was an experiment for Kinexus to open up that sort of like what would happen if you opened up, you know, cross organization sharing and collaboration on a particular topic or yeah. you know yeah it was it was it was a lot of fun yeah all right so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here um, Greg uh, you, you, <laughs> we always we 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 pick on Greg for saying what not that's uh, your favorite what's the word disfluency disfluency. Yeah, was uh, I using it during this? What not? Okay. You, you, you did, and it's okay. But what what's the word disfluency? Because that's a word people probably don't know. I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, getting rid of the ands ums. One of the ones I've been really focused on lately is like I I, I have this habit of doing. What you can say the exact same sentence without the word like, and it means the exact same things if you're using it as a filler. And uh, there's a lot of ways to get disfluencies out. Mostly it's simply slowing your speech down and putting pauses in when you realize you're about to say it. And uh, you'll get quicker and quicker about those pauses, but that's, yeah. that's the main way. So yeah, it's... Um, so it's sorry, to po sorry to poke at you about that, but you know, habits are hard to break. You know, I know you've worked on it. We're all working on it. It's a matter of growth mindset. Right, Greg is not bad with different disfluencies. He's working on it. He's growing. Or maybe I'm bad with disfluencies, but it doesn't make me a bad person because I'm bad right. with disfluencies. Or I couldn't get better with that. 
<laughs> yeah, it certainly does not make you uh, a bad person. So well, we want to thank everybody uh, for staying on here today. Um, we'll, we'll do one of these. Hopefully we won't wait another 10 months or so. Let, let's do one of these sooner. Um, the next presentation webinar, again, is going to be on November 1st. Dave Kippen um, talking about lean and mindfulness. So you'll be able to register for that real soon at kinexus.com slash webinar. So Greg, hey, this, this was fun. Thank you. Thank for you, Mark. I, I always I always learn so much being with you and, and hearing you talk and think through different things. So I appreciate it. Well, likewise, I, I appreciate it too. And I want to thank everyone for kind of joining us as we, uh, we stand here in Gab. So thanks again. We'll see everyone kind next time. Yeah, next time. <laughs>